Welcome to the first proper installment of Following Tokyo Games, a series in which I will be both critiquing and documenting the media created by Tokyo Games, a studio founded in part by some of the folks who worked on Danganronpa and Zero Escape. This time around we'll be focusing on the full motion video title, Death Come True, directed and written by Kazutaka Kodaka. As a quick aside, for clarity's sake, I will be using genre terms such as visual novel in a fairly loose fashion. I'm not one for genre semantics, and while I am aware the term means something different in the West than in Japan, it's easiest to apply it broadly. If you would like to learn more about the origins and where the term visual novel comes from, I suggest these two videos from Bowl of Lentils. Something that struck me the entire time I played Death Come True, from the cinematography to the OST, is a feeling of an independent film. And not the sort that still technically has a large-ish budget and sweeps up the awards at film festivals. I'm talking about the sort of movie that a few buddies make, with whatever they've got, which makes a whole lot of sense after hearing about the game's conception. In an interview Gamatsu had with Kodaka, he had this to say. We were having a few drinks with some friends and colleagues, and we got excited talking about an FMV game. So we thought we'd make one ourselves. That's how it all came about. So we started things after that pretty casual discussion, approaching it like making an independent movie. Death Come True does not have a variety of sets. It doesn't have a large cast. CG effects exist, but they're often additive to the live action footage rather than the foundation of any scene. It's also the length of a movie, coming in around the two hour mark for a single playthrough. In fact, Tokyo Games had not intended for this to be their debut game, but production moved along so well that they decided it was best just to put it out there. In an interview with Silicon Era, Kodaka said, I think releasing a title that isn't very game-like as our first represents the character of Tokyo Games well. While there are Kodaka-isms all over, and I don't think it does anything too shocking for an FMV, it certainly is an interesting first project that isn't 100% what you might expect from this team. At the same time, that lack of predictability is fitting for them. It's important to note that Death Come True is not solely a Tokyo Games production. In fact, the bulk of the development took place at a squadra. They are a relatively small team working out of a quaint modern home that has been repurposed into an office space. The company has had a hand in software design for online payment systems to social games as well, but has largely transitioned into helping small Japanese developers, assisting on initial development and or taking charge of porting games to other platforms. I ended the introduction video to the series on this broad point, that the structure at Tokyo Games is more of a house of creatives. The staff might come up with the initial concepts, write the story, do character designs, compose music, and maybe even assume the role of director, but the bulk of the game design or animation process has been done outside the studio in a number of their early projects. Before all that though, those ideas are sold to publishers, in this instance Izanagi Games, who will come up later in this series. The setup to Death Come True is simple. Your character, Makoto Karaki, wakes up in a hotel room without knowing how he got there or who he is. However, moments later, he sees his face on the news. He's a wanted serial killer. He then stumbles into the bathroom to find a woman tied up and unconscious in the tub. He attempts to uncover who he truly is and what's going on in this odd hotel. Interactivity arrives via simple choices. You hear a knock at the door and see the police. Do you open it or do you hide in the closet and launch a sneak attack on the unsuspecting officer? From there the live action plays out and you may just receive a bad ending. If not, you continue on making successive choices until finding the true ending. The bad endings will result in Karaki being killed, or close to it, then waking up just as he did at the start of the day, then realizing he's in some sort of time loop. That's the premise, but of course, as is to be expected from a game written and directed by Kodaka, things get a little squirrely. Broadly speaking, the discussion of mechanics in visual novels tends to be fairly myopic. 
How many choices are there? How many endings? Are there puzzle elements or some other form of traditional gameplay? What I've found from talking or listening to those who aren't big fans of the genre is that they have a pretty limited view of what the genre can be. Even sometimes leading to the always insufferable conversation of are visual novels actually games? The truth is, even when you focus on the choice and branching narrative aspects, developers have all these nuanced little ways of differentiating their implementation. At times, Depression Quest will present the player with options, but no matter what you choose, the character will not follow through. It conveys the way depression prevents people from doing what they want or know is good for them. We know the devil doesn't place the player in the shoes of a single character, but simultaneously lets you direct the three leads preventing a bias of self-interest. Steins Gate presents many of its choices through seemingly innocuous interactions with Okabe's phone. Whether you choose to answer a phone call or reply to an email, these can have a sort of butterfly effect on the narrative, which ties into the time travel conceit. How choices are framed can come in many different forms, from complex to fairly simple like in Death Come True. When a choice appears, the live action footage freezes often to a 180 or 360 degree still panorama image. These moments are not attempting to emulate real world conditions, whereas something like a Telltale game takes advantage of the player's indecision. Or in the FMV space, Netflix's Black Mirror, Bandersnatch does something similar. In both of those games, not making a choice is a choice, whether you panicked or simply decided not to respond. That's not the case here. You have all the time in the world, so what does that framing say? It's quite possible that this was a technical limitation for a smaller team. Maybe they simply wanted to emulate television and film where when faced with a tough decision, the world grinds to a halt around the protagonist. With that intentional pause comes not pressure, but drama. Or maybe this says something about Kataki's ability to rapidly process information. Trouble is, he's not some super genius thinking at a faster degree than any other human. In fact, he is often characterized as panicked, especially in the first two-thirds of the story. Honestly, the choice here feels shallow, if still a neat aesthetic. Pausing the live action to transition to the stills with the UI popping in is fairly sleek. Or there is another possibility. Maybe something's not quite right with this world. Maybe Karaki has more control than he thinks. One of the most interesting twists on top of the choice-based narrative is a fact revealed near the climax. Karaki has discovered that the hotel and the people in it are just part of a simulation. His real body is currently attached to a machine that has created a fictional world with the help of his memories. He's not actually a serial killer. Instead, he and the woman in the tub, who he has since teamed up with, are both police on the tail of the real killer. The monstrous man chasing them around is a crooked cop who is hacking into the digital world. The hotel desk worker reveals to Kataki in an ironic twist that he has had a choice to leave the simulation at multiple points. He then recalls the game over screen. This is where the player chooses to continue or quit. The truth within the game's fiction is Kataki is making this choice. It's a clever little moment where the game subverts player expectations around what interface is just for them, the player, and what is being seen by the characters. Naturally, the player wants to press on with a story, pulled in by the intrigue, the desire to see all the content. This does align with Kataki's inquisitive nature as a detective and his motivation to find the person who killed someone dear to him. This loops back to my point about the freeze frames. Are these moments actually paused for Kataki, or is it simply a dramatic effect? We never really know, but given his lack of comment at any point, it does seem to lean towards the former. A big issue in visual novels, especially when you start involving time loops, is repetition of content. Sometimes this is just something you deal with as a player. Veterans of the genre circumvent this by keeping a litany of carefully placed save files. Sometimes though a game offers a fast forward or a skip through all the repeated content option. Even better are the times where you can just pick a point in a timeline. Death Come True being the tightly packaged filmic experience that it is does something that, well, films do. 
Players are shown scenes no more than they are needed. If a scene is repeated, it's done so with purpose, whether that's to emphasize an aspect of the loop or Kataki's frustration with such. Otherwise, you are not made to repeat much. Death Come True is an efficient package. Its budget, or lack thereof, shows, but not in a bad way. There is no extra fat in need of trimming. It is what it says on the package. A movie-length FMV title written and directed by Kazutaka Kodaka. And you know what? I may not love it in the way I do many of the Danganronpa games, but I'm an absolute sucker for this genre even when simply executed. In an interview with the channel Archipel, Kodaka reveals his process is deceptively normal for someone who doesn't write normal stories. Citing David Lynch as a big influence, and discussing that Killer 7's disregard for structure isn't something he feels he could do, even with his zany stories. He views his work and creative process in a very formulaic nature at the foundational level. He likes to work efficiently, and rather than letting the character lead the story, the story shapes the types of characters he writes. As the series goes on, I hope it helps in giving us a better understanding of the creative process behind games. That, as complex of a house of cards on a blustery winter day that they can be, and as much a barrier that languages and varying degrees of secrecy can form, that it is often as simple as sitting down at a restaurant, chatting with your friends over a few beers, and dreaming about what you could create together. That's the first episode in following Tokyo Games. I hope this is an idea that people enjoy. It's something that I've given a lot of thought to, and something that is going to require a lot of work. If you would like to support such, you can do so over on Coffee and Patreon. The length of these entries could range pretty significantly, and having a little monetary backing for them would certainly be much appreciated. And for all of those who have supported me in any way, I say thank you.